The Balonas to the Apostles of Great Millstone. Peace and salutations to all the Akim, the elders, the bishops, pushing the gospel out in truth and sincerity. I'm going to continue with this uh, reading of vultures in eagles' clothing. Uh, I last left off um, Lonsdale's versus uh, the United States government. So we're going to continue with that. The bulk of the Lonsdale's suits, the bulk of the Lonsdale's suit constitutes a refrain about the federal government's power to tax wages or to tax individuals at all, which the Lonsdale's have been pursuing for at least 14 years. After exercising considerable patience and tolerance, the internal reverend, uh, the, uh, the fifth circuit finally imposed money sanctions totaling uh, $1,445.55 uh, $1, on the Lonsdales for the repeated attempt to uh, re-litigate re issues already adjudicated by the courts. So they were getting tired of the Lonsdales and they threw that sanction on them. Uh, as in the case of the Lonsdales tax as, as in the case of the Lonsdales, tax protesters attract the ire not only of the internal revenue, which, re which rejects their substantive arguments, but of the court system itself, which finds tax protesters a drain on precious judicial resources of time and energy. Thus judges fight back with court-imposed sanctions for frivolous filings and appeals. The Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, because it includes a region of the country, Illinois, Indiana and Wisconsin, in which the tax protest movement has traditionally been um, ex exceptionally active, has fought a low level campaign against tax protesters for years. For example, in United States versus Buckner, the trial court granted the prosecutor's request for an order forbidding the, the defense to bring to the attention of the jury by argument or, or evidence any matters relating to five enumerated issues that the 16th Amendment to the US Constitution was improperly ratified and therefore never came into being. The wages are not income and therefore are not subject to federal income tax laws. The, 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 the tax laws are un, unconstitutional. Th that filing a tax return violates the, uh, the privilege against self-incrimination under the Fifth Amendment to the US Constitution. That Federal Reserve notes do not constitute cash or income. And let's read some of these. Uh, Internal Revenue Service Department of the Treasury. Why do I have to pay taxes? That's available online. Right. C. Lonsdale versus Smells are 709 F.2D 910 5th Circuit 983. Lonsdale versus. Um, basically Inland Revenue, CIR. Okay. The defendant United States, through its internal reven revenue service, employs erroneous, erroneous, erroneously, illegally, unlawfully, and unconstitutionally made an amendment for seizure of the plaintiff. This is in regards to the Lonsdales. Property personnel and real in the form of their labor property or labor services property and their wage compensation, paycheck, money, income, specialized type of property they receive directly from their occupation of common right by their labor property and or labor services property. The United States tax laws at the Federal Code of Tax Regulations at 26 CFR and Title 26 USC 6331 
since they have no lawful colour of constitutional taxing and tax collecting authority and jurisdiction to apply any Article 1. Section 8. Indirect excise taxes upon the plaintiffs, occupation of common rights, their labour property, their labour services property and their wage compensation, paycheck money, income specialised type of property without apportionment. It's very technical, this language, very technical, can easily um, trip up someone that was of faint heart or just not privy, not wise to it, because there's a lot of uh, conjecture um, and there's, there's probably a lot of loopholes in this. Or with the 16th Amendment, indirect excise income tax upon the plaintiff's occupation of common right, their labour property, their labour services property, or their wage compensation, paycheck, money, income, specialised type of property without apportionment, or with any 1939 Public Employee Salary Tax Act withholding direct tax which pertains strictly to federal government officers, employees and elected officials, and which is absolutely unconstitutional as shown by section number four of the Act, and Title IV, USC section 111, without apportionment. So let's continue. The Seventh Circuit upheld the District Court's action describing these five defences as tired and when raised in litigation, as in Judge Eastbrook's words, sanction bait. The Internal Revenue Service in its brochure entitled, Why Do I Have to Pay Taxes? includes some of these arguments as well, describing them as myths, Larry, Larry Baycraft with some expiration, identifies 30 patriot arguments destroyed by the courts. Why do these arguments nonetheless proliferate? One reason might be strategic. Under the, under the Supreme Court's rulings in, in United States versus Cheek, a person cannot be criminally prosecuted for tax fraud unless the government can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he or she did not simply break the tax laws, but did so willingly, willfully. A person has acted willfully if she knows that she is legally obligated to pay taxes but she disagrees with the law or otherwise chooses not to comply. A person has not acted willfully if she sincerely believes that she has no tax liability. Thus, there is a legal incentive for tax protest arguments to be not just wrong but richly, densely, extravagantly wrong. The more obscured argument, the more plausible it might be that a taxpayer actually believed it. <laughs> all while, all, this is interesting because, you know, it's all whilst swearing on the Bible. Do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth? And then, you know, and the Bible says you're not supposed to tax, you're not supposed to use, use jewellery, you're not supposed to hold taxes uh, past the sun going down. Uh, but I digress. Let's look at Buckner. So United States versus Buckner, that was 7th Circuit, 1987. The 8th Circuit has also shown a certain lack of patience with respect to tax protesters. See example, United States versus Moss, 604 F.2D, 569 8th Circuit, 1979. Upholding the defendant's conviction of on five counts of aiding and abetting the, uh, the filing of false withholding information. Based on the radio interview the defendant gave on how to avoid federal, uh, federal withholding tax. United States versus Butoff, 572 F.2D 619 8th Circuit, 1978. Upholding the defendant's conviction on nine counts of aiding and abetting to file false or fraudulent income tax returns in violation of 26 USC 7205 and 18 USC 
too, despite evidence showing that aside from providing one person with a fraudulently completed W4 form, defendants' activists consisted of speaking at seminars, see Francis X versus uh, see Francis X Sullivan, the uh, usurping octopus of jurisdictional authority, the legal theories of sovereign citizen movement. 1999 WISLRE REV 7885161617 Advocate aggressive prosecution of tax protesters based on the these presidents. So uh, this last person also held seminars and um, uh, and another number of things such as these looks or these books or papers that he's written, uh, basically training people how to avoid the tax. He's basically playing a Robin Hood, Robin Hood role, which is righteous, really. Uh, 53. Why do I have to pay taxes? Super note 46. 54. Larry Baycraft destroyed arguments. Dixieland Law Journal at. Uh, Hi, 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 .net, highway dot net highway dot net four nine eight US one nine two nine nine one these are just accounts. As a previous measure, however, the majority drew a distinction between making m mistake uh, the the majority drew a distinction between being mistaken about the law and disagreeing with the law that neatly placed tax protesters on the wrong side. Claims that some of the provisions of the tax code are unconstitutional do not arise from innocent mistakes caused by the complexity of the internal uh, revenue code. Rather, they reveal full knowledge of the provisions at is, as at, it, at issue. And a studied conclusion however wrong, that those provisions are invalid and unenforceable. Thus, in this case, Cheek paid his taxes for years, but after attending various seminars and based on his own study, he concluded that the income tax laws could not constitutionally require him to pay a tax. We do not believe that Congress contemplated that such a taxpayer without risking criminal prosecution could ignore the, the duties imposed upon him by the Internal Revenue Code and refuse to utilize the mechanisms provided by Congress to present his claims of invalidity, invalidity to the courts and to abide by their decisions. Mm. Larry Braycraft's Dixieland Law Journal. So this is 58. Larry Baycraft's Dixieland Law Journal has a section devoted to scam artists whom he calls out by name so that others may learn what has happened and protect themselves. See Larry Baycraft scams Dixieland Law Journal at highway.net. See United 59. See United States versus Cooper. 170F.3D691692, 7th Circuit, 1999. Finding no reason why sanctions for frivolous squared arguments such as Cooper's arguments that only residents of Washington, D.C. and other fe federal enclaves are subject to the federal tax laws because they are alone, because they alone are citizens of the United States and that wages are not income because they are compensation for working rather than a pure economic rent cannot be imposed under Rule 38 of the Federal Rules of Appellate Procedure in criminal as well as civil cases. See Daniel Lessard, Levin and Michael W. Mitchell, a law unto themselves. The ideology of the common law court movement 44 SDL Rev 910 1999 a recent report by the Anti-Defamation League found that new militia groups have expanded in only five states, remained relatively sta stable in about 20 states, 
and declined elsewhere since the Oklahoma City bombing. So let's read that again. A recent report by the Anti-Defamation League found that new militia groups have expanded in only five states, remained relatively stable in about 20 states, and declined elsewhere since the Oklahoma City bombing. Militia activists have instead been... Uh, Militia activists have instead been advising members to keep a low profile. In contrast, the common law, court and personal sovereignty movements have grown rapidly with the Anti-Defamation League noting ever-increasing cross-fertilisation between militia and common law court activists. So, let's see... Of the various movements that general legal populism, the militia movement is far smaller than the common law and personal sovereignty movements described in subsequent sections. The militia movement's emphasis on the need for uh, revolutionary violence, however, has attracted a great deal of media attention. The Second Amendment of the United States Constitution reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the sec- uh, security for a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. There is little case law on the meaning of the Second Amendment, but an enormous literature, much of it popular, has arisen concerning the questions of the constitutionally Uh, the constitutionality of gun control laws and the meaning of constitutional rights to bear arms. Constitutional scholar David Williams sums up the legal debate over the meaning of the Second Amendment guarantee as one that has hardened into, into two opposing positions. The state's rights, the, 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 the state's rights position that the amendment does not convey an individual an individual's right to bear arms and the individual right position that it does large mainstream organization like the national the NRA National Rifle Association obviously prefer the second interpretation of the second amendment and they have assiduously pro, uh, promulgated promulgated it in academic, popular and political venues. The the militia subculture also adheres to the individual rights interpretation of the Second Amendment, albeit from a slightly different direction. Consider, for example, a document called the Declarations of Alteration and Reform, published by a group called the Committee of the States in Congress and dated July 4th, 1984. This document declares that the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, among other agencies, is opposing, is operating outside the United States Constitution and is thus hereby hereby dissolved. It concludes, uh, it it concludes, wherein the delegates of the sovereign, wherein the delegates of the sovereign states of the union do hereby declare as the committee of the as the committee of the states assembled in congress that the above adopted articles of the declaration of alteration and reform are the law of the land any interference with the implementation and execution of said articles shall be considered as an act of sedition against the government of these United States of America and shall be punishable under law. Any interference or attempt to obstruct the functions of this committee of the states or any of its delegates shall result in imposition of the death penalty upon conviction of the committee sitting as the Congress of the United States. So as you read through these articles, it's very clear uh, what the Constitution was about and who it was for. Um, And the people obviously um, being blinded by their 
disdainful, the lower, the the the, the ones that are con- s- labeled minorities, um, have seen this. Um, the forms created by their founding fathers as something which is, you know, dear to them, something which protects them, something which what which is for them. And although it is for them, there is still um, a hierarchy. And that hierarchy goes banking families and everyone else pretty much so let's continue with this read it's very interesting this manifesto this uh, manifesto is the sort of thing that mainstream observers usually dismiss with epithets like loony irrational and paranoid Yet this radical opposition to the national government starts from intellectual principles that are not far from professional constitutional theory. For example, Ma argues that the the federalism requires checks and balances between state and federal power in at least three areas, military, political and legal. Under this view, state and local militias were envisioned under the constitutional schemes as checks on the power of the national army. The very existence of small but expandable populist shadow armies organized by state governments could deter abuse of much larger professional standing army organized by the national government. The national government could forcefully forcefully put down any purely local coup or insurrection threatening the republican government of a single state but could be thwarted in the genuine scheme of national tyranny by an alliance of local militias led by state governments. Amar is quick to contain his suggestion, but saying that that resort to the military can only be... Amar is quick to contain his suggestion by saying that Resort to the military can only be justified if political and legal challenges to national power have failed. If the national courts have shut down all their judgments, or all their judgments are un- unenforceable, and the only applic- applicable law is martial law, uh, enforced by gun and sword. Right. So if the national courts have shut down or their judgments are enforceable and the only applicable law is martial law enforced by gun and sword. Gun and sword. Well, the gun is the sword. This is like biblical language there. Gun and sword. You know, the police and the armies, they're not going to be parading around with a sword. But you can see the biblical connotations there. Gun and sword. I mean, the gun is the sword. The gun is the modern day sword. So you really just have to say gun or you can just say sword. You don't have to say gun and sword, but uh, I digress. But in a world of legal populism, political and legal challenges have already failed. So we are already living under martial law. Of course, this is, uh, and you've seen that in the last two years, um, how bills of rights and um, all of these forms and you know all of these levies and all of this it can be shut down just by an order there's a there's a certain name for it, a government order or president's order or something you can just throw it all it can all be thrown in the bin so all of this law all of this conjecture it just turns into you know, they just like I said, all of those laws were made for the banking families. They weren't made for the everyman. More significant than militias in terms of its effects on the mainstream world is so-called paper terrorism, 
the use of legal documents to have, see this is the real this is the this is the real dangerous one the pen you know you've heard of the old saying the pen is mightier than the sword so this is the real here we go see brave new legal world the common law movement here we go more significant than malicious in terms of its effects on the mainstream world is so-called paper terrorism. The use of legal documents to harass public officials. The filing of pseudo legal papers is associated uh, let's find where that goes with the so-called common law court movement. See that? So let's read that again. The use of legal documents that harass public officials. So the filing of suedo, suedo so like uh, fake legal papers, is associated with the so called common law court movement. Common law courts represent the civil equivalent of private militias. They declare their existing legal infrastructure illegitimate and establish their own. Daniel Levine and Michael Mitchell explained the phenomenon. Once organised, common law courts publish their rules in the local newspapers and begin holding court sessions. These common law courts hold sessions in garages, restaurants, churches, homes, convention centres, bingo parlours, hotel rooms and for one common law court, a multi-use room at the state's uh, capital building. So let me go back to this actually. Common law, so let's go back to the top. Common law courts represent a civil equivalent of private militias. They declare that existing legal infrastructure illegitimate and establish their own. Daniel Levine and Michael Mitchell explained the phenomenon. So here we go. Daniel Levine and Michael Mitchell described the 1980s farm crisis as a moment when this activity reached a peak. During this time, farmers faced with uh, foreclosure began to file bogus land p patents, which they believed would shield their property from any encumbrances by state or local officials, including county sheriffs serving eviction notice notices or warrants to seize their property. All of these attempts failed in the courts in which they were heard. Such land patents only demonstrated that the federal government no longer holds ti uh, title to the land. None of the patents cancelled out interests held by other parties. The largest of these schemes promoted by a group called the National Agricultural Press Association, Press Association NAPA, assured farmers that none of their loans acquired since 1974 were legal. And that they could have and that they could have those loans declared null and void by filing lawsuits and avoiding the use of lawyers so let's see once once organized common law courts published their rules in the local newspapers and begin um, begin holding court sessions these common law courts hold sessions in garages uh, restaurants, churches, homes, convention centres, bingo parlours, hotel rooms, and for one common law court, a multi-use multi -use room at the state capitol building. So this is the people fighting against the government. They're meeting anywhere they can. Anywhere they can. Judges are elected or self-appointed, and the number of judges varies from court to court, although the appointment of 12 justices is favoured in purview of chapter 45 of the Magna Carta. And like I say, um, all of this, all of this fight back, this pushback, it goes back to the scripture where it says, um, you know, Esau, his brethren, is, his neighbour is spoiled, his brethren, brethren is spoiled, everyone else is spoiled and he is not. 
and and it also pertains to the scripture where it says uh, if satan be divided against satan satan means adversary so if adversary be divided against adversary it cannot stand like if the same adversary is divided against the same adversary it cannot it cannot stand like that whole structure cannot stand and this is what you're seeing um like i mentioned in the last video that Amalek is the chief of uh, of Edom. Amalek are the people that um, refer to themselves as Jewish today, that are in the land of Israel, Israel and Palestine. Uh, they're also known as Khazars. Some people call them Khazars, but they are the chief. They are like the very, very top of the pyramid of Edom. Uh, however, they see their brethren as cattle. Their brethren are called Goyim, Goyim, Goyim in the Yiddish, which means cattle. So they do filter some money down to some big names, but not all. Uh, and this is where you get these pushback. So people meeting in bingo parlors, hotel rooms, and for one common law court, a multi-use room at the state capitol building. Judges are elected or self-appointed, and the number of judges varies from court to court, although the appointment of 12 justices is favoured in purview of Chapter 45 of the Magna Carta. I'm not aware of the Magna Carta. I've heard that term quite a lot. Magna Carta, let me just quickly type in and see uh, what comes up with Magna Carta. M Magna Carta. So, here. Magna Carta Liberata Liberatum, medieval Latin for Great Charter of freedoms commonly called magna carta it's a royal charter of rights agreed to by the king john uh, of england england at runnymede near windsor on 15th of june 12 12 15 first drafted by archbishop of canterbury stephen langton to make peace between the unpopular king and a group of rebel barons it promised the protection of church rights, protection for the barons from illegal imprisonment, access to swift justice and limitations on feudal payments to the crown. To be implemented through a council of 25 barons, neither side stood behind their commitments and the charter was annulled by Pope Innocent III, leading to the First Barons' War. After John's death, the Regency government of his young son, Henry III, reissued the document in 1216, stripped of some of its more radical content in an, in an unsuccessful bid to build political support for, for their cause. At the end of the war in 1217, it formed part of the peace treaty agreed at Lambeth, where the document acquired the name Magna Carta to distinguish it from the smaller charter of the forest, which was issued at the same time. Short of funds, Henry reissued the charter again in 1225 in exchange for a grant of new taxes. His son, Edward I, repeated the exercise in 1297, this time confirming it, confirming it as part of England's statute law. The charter became part of English political life and was typically renewed by each monarch in turn, although it, as time went by and the uh, fledging parliament of england passed new laws it lost some of its practical significance so it goes on so basically it was a bill made to uh it was like it was a union it, it, it had the same um connotations as a union you know when you go into a job and there's a union that certain things certain things can run and certain things can't run certain things um but this is a paper this is not a union this is a bill this was actually a law 
but you can see it didn't work and it's being rehashed and rehashed and rehashed it. Anyway, it's back to this paper, back to this book run. Enforcement of common laws, in, enforcement of common law courts decisions first falls upon local sheriffs, the only office that common law courts recognize as legitimate. In some instances, after the local sheriffs have not recognized their authority, common law courts have appointed their own sheriffs and marshals who enforce the laws of the court. There have been instances when common law court marshals have burst into federal courtrooms wearing official looking badges and uniforms to serve their papers. As a last resort, some common law courts call upon militia groups for enforcement when the people have no place to go but to the constitutional militia. Instances of physical violence against the state by legal populists, such as those committed by militia groups, group members, are sporadic and frequently committed by lone wolves. But acts of uh, discursive violence against the public officials in particular, and against the legal system more ge generally, are a hallmark of the common law court movement. As Levin and Mitchell observe, seeking to redress the grievances of their members, activists rev uh, reverse court rulings. Seeking to redress the grievances of their members, activists reverse court rulings, issue threatening subpoenas, and generally harass those that deem as those that they deem as enemies. Sometimes harassment by activists comes in retaliation for government against action against one of their members. Levin and Mitchell note that common law activists have also singled out particular state officials as political targets. Much of the activity of common law courts involves the reversal of early rulings by legitimate state and federal court including divorces and parental custody disputes. Sometimes, however, their activities are more ambitious. The Montana-based Freeman, for example, apparently spearheaded a multi-state trend of passing bad checks and money orders, based on the notion that Federal Reserve notes are not legal money. These programs of harassment or legal jamming coexist with and draw strength from a more positive project. The rediscovery by ordinary Americans of the common law tradition. For some legal populists, the common law tradition is rooted in English history and stands for absolute protection of private property. The, illegi the illegitimacy of courts equity and law merchant, which have usurped the rightful common law tradition, and thus the illegitimacy of any state or federal statutes abridging private property rights. For others, the common law tradition is ultimately rooted in the Christian Bible and, and the Judeo-Christian tradition. Some websites concerning the common law are devoted to constructing histories of how the common law was usurped by other illeg illegitimate forms of law. Others are devoted to reconstruction that law. The common law court of the United States of, of America, for example, declares its projects, its project as founding a new society bound together by the common law and promises that this law will uh, gradually supplant the illegitimate federal law as the members of the new society introduced their law into federal courts. Finally, concerns about citizen privacy have converged with legal populism in a narrative concerning the federal government's effort to create a one world government or new world order through placing all American citizens under surveillance. In this narrative, social security numbers and driver's licenses 
are the first step towards the surveillance. A new legal twist in this fight appears in the suit filed in an Alabama, in an Alabama state court in which Lowell H. Beck Baycraft Jr. is representing Scott McDonald in an action for declar uh, declar declaratory judgment against the State Department of Motor Vehicles. McDonald and his sons objected to the administ administrative rule under which applicants for a driver's license were required to submit their social security numbers. The legal basis for their object objection was the First Amendment. McDonald and his sons believed that the federal SSN social security numbers believed that the federal SSN is at least the precursor to the biblical mark of the beast described in Revelation and therefore the social security number requirement violated the free exercise clause. This case joins other litigation on the issue taking a free exercise approach. This is getting interesting. So this, these, the, uh, they argued that the whole social security number was on the way to, it, it was a form of the mark of the beast. And it's close, but when, you know, if you know what the actual mark of the beast is, because if, the, if these people actually knew what, what, what the banking families were planning and what the mark of the beast is, they would be very outraged. It's, it's, the mark of the beast is a, a chip which is implanted underneath the skin in the right hand or the forehead. This is what it states in Revelation, but ultimately it could be anywhere in your person. And this chip, uh, as described in Aaron Russo's interview, where he talks of speaking with one of the top banking families, one of the Rothschilds, as uh, one of the Rockefellers rather. Um, I'm not sure if it was one of the Rockefellers or the Rothschilds, but one of the top banking families, he spoke to uh, one of the nephews and they said, yeah, that's this is what we want to do. We want to chip everyone. We want to have all their data on that chip. And if they rise up against us, we'll just switch it off. So as I've been reading previously, you've seen that they've been dishing out fines because they're, um, they're annoyed. The courts are annoyed that people um, are, you know, how dare they can't c come and file a complaint against us, especially when we've dealt with that complaint here, have this sanction. So what they plan to do is no more of that. They'll just switch off your chip so you won't be able to buy or sell. As it says in Revelations, you won't be able to, you won't be able to buy or sell, save you have this chip. And you've seen uh, episodes of things like Black Mirror. Um, there's one episode in Black Mirror where it has a, where it has exactly this same thing which I'm talking about, where your whole um, existence is based off of this chip. So your interactions with people, they grade you. Um, everyday interactions, they grade you. They grade you whether you're buying a coffee, or let's say you open a door for someone, they will grade you up. If you have an altercation with someone, they'll grade you down. Um, when you fall below a certain grade, then you are locked out of society. And this is what they want to implement. And this is what you see the Chinese implementing as well. This is what is happening in China. They're, they're doing away with cash and they're coming up with this whole, you pay, you pay for things based on your, um, uh, your score, what people have scored you, which is completely uh, ridiculous, which is completely backwards in a society which is, which is completely upside down and morally, morally uh, bankrupt. How can anyone who is righteous, 
how can anyone who follows the laws and statutes of the Bible be of good score, be of good cheer in such a society? So this is um, this is one of the, the last prophecies to take place before a major, major um, develop, developments in, in, in the world we live and also in the spiritual realm. So we await that. Let's continue. As, as Professor Amar notes, during the American Revolution and immediately after it, constitutional debate focused on whether sovereignty resided in government or in the people and how federalism showed, uh, should operate within empire and confederation. The American revolutionary view was that true sovereignty resided in the people themselves. In one sense, this idea was not new. John Locke, for example, had recognized that in an inalienable right of the people to alter or abolish their government through the exercise of the transcendent right of revolution. And long before 1776, the British had exercised the right of the glorious revolution of 1688. In another sense, however, the American view of sovereignty was new. 18th century English theorists like William Blackstone blunted the possible radical implications of Locke's theory by arguing that the king and parliament, the government, embodied the sovereignty of the people. In contrast, the American view was that people at all times retained full sovereignty. The government was only a representative, agent, delegate, deputy or servant of the people. James Wilson thus argued that government never had sovereignty, only power. Others like Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, John Marshall and James R. De Idell used the word sovereignty to mean the government's power within its limited sphere of delegation. But the problem of how to make such a theory workable in practice still remained. The Articles of Confederation eventually fell apart because the, the center did, did not hold with the sovereignty placed in the people of each state. The new constitution placed sovereignty in a different people, the people of the United States. But as Amar notes, this formulation did not end the debate. As the civil war approached, the question was what the phrase we the people in the constitution really meant. Did it represent a sharp break from the Articles of Confederation? Was there now a new national people? Or did the people of each state remain sovereign? On one side, states, on one side, states' rights argued that Americans had never become one people. On the other side, nationalists, nationalists argued that Americans had been one people since independence. The middle ground staked out by Chief Justice Marshall in the 19th century was that many peoples became one people through the ratification of the Constitution. The 18th century debate between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists and the 19th century debate between the states' rights and the Nationalists still echo on the internet. But the legal populists have come to a different resolution than the professional constitutional scholars. This difference can be seen clearly in the debate surrounding the 14th Amendment. Professor Amar argues that the 14th Amendment ratified in 1866 offers a different vision of citizenship than did the original Constitution and Bill of Rights. The original bill focused centrally on empowering the people collectively against government agents following their own agenda. The 14th Amendment, by contrast, focused on protecting minorities against even re uh, uh, responsive, representative, majoritarian government. Over and over, the 1789 Bill proclaimed the rights and the powers of the people phrases conjuring up civic uh, republican, republicanism. 
collective political art, uh, action, public rights and positive liberty. The complement the com the complementary phrase in the eighteen sixty six amendment privileges or immunities of citizens indicates a subtle but real shift of emphasis reflecting a vision more liberal than republican more individualistic individualistic than collectivist more private than public more negative than affirmative meshing these two sub uh, meshing these two subtly Meshing these two subtly different visions of constitutional government together has been the subject of one of the greatest debates of the 20th, uh, the 20th century among lawyers, justice, justices and law professors. What is the relationship between the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment? One legal focus of this debate is the so-called doctrine of incorporation. Does the amendment incorporate the bill, making the bill's restrictions on federal power applicable against the state? A second focus more representing for our people's concerns, the meaning of citizenship. Section one of the 14th amendment only states all persons born or naturalized in the uh, United States and are subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside, the Constitution provides no clear def uh, definition of national citizenship. Yet, as Amar points out, the people of America were sovereign. Then once Americans, uh, then one, if the people of Americans were sovereign, then once American citizenship was all important and should never have been treated as simply derivative of one's state citizenship under state constitutions or subject to virtually limitless manipulation by ordinary legislation. The complex legal issues concerning the source of antebellum citizenship were never fully resolved. Some legal populists take up these same problems. The relationship between the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment generally and the puzzle of national and state citizenship more specifically. But their resolution is quite different, whereas the professional constitutionalists assume that the antebellum and the reconstruction constitutions must somehow be meshed together. The legal populists argue that the antebellum constitution and the reconstruction constitution are in effect two separate constitutions that create two different classes of citizens. Under this theory, sovereign citizenship is the original form of citizenship and carries with it the inalienable political rights uh, enumerated in the Bill of Rights. The 14th Amendment, in contrast, created a different and inferior kind of citizenship one which carries with it civil rights, uh, with its civil rights, rights that are in fact more uh, mere privileges granted by the government and revocable at its whim. Jared Held Sui Jury explains it in this way. The citizens of the United States did not exist until after the Civil War. In 1866, as the forerunner of the 14th Amendment, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act. Through this law, Congress created a new class of rights for freed former slaves who were not involved with these sovereign rights by the Treaty of Peace and who therefore had no access to the courts. These newly classed persons, uh, my note persons, that is as opposed to people who hold sovereignty, were thereby given, act, uh, were thereby given civil rights. Civil rights were said to be the same as those that the citizens already had by virtue of his or her birth and blood. Therefore, the alleged ratification of the 14th Amendment and later through the uh, Social Security Act, these civil rights extended through deliberate non-disclosure to almost everyone in America as one requests a social security account number one claims to be a U US citizen. All benefits and civil rights then become part of the now converted person's life. In this way, nearly everyone in the United States has voluntarily, voluntarily given up their inalienable rights.
God-given fundamental rights and sovereign status to be granted the privileges and immunities of civil rights as subjects of Congress, i.e. US citizens. Held goes on to explain that one's civil rights, unlike one's inalienable rights, are regulated by the government, Congress, who grants them and who therefore can take them away. People were informed of their civil rights, not of their inalienable rights or sovereign rights, because most, most Americans have been tricked into believing that they are citizens of the United States. Most have no idea that by claiming US citizenship, they voluntarily choose civil rights instead of their natural birthright. What are the implications of this very different theory of relationships between the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment? First is the legalistic idea that by discovering and proclaiming your true sovereign citizenship, the federal government no longer has any claim on you, which includes the government's claim of tax liability. Thus, one can purchase books such as Vultures and Eagles Cloven, which will show you how to change your current acquired legal status of voluntary US enslaved uh, subject back to your original born status of free born sovereign American citizen who has the same rights and uh, prior prerogatives as the King of England. Prerogatives. So, subject back to your original born status of free born sovereign American citizen who has the same rights and prerogatives as the King of England. I've called this notion legalistic, but of course it is also profoundly romantic. It draws on the American penchant for, uh, for, for conspiracies, the fantasy that there really is another secret America behind the facade of this one, and that with an act of will, one can simply step through the door to a world in which one can be reborn as the King of England and of course not have to pay any taxes. A person, a, a second and more troubling implication of this theory is that only certain people can be sovereign citizens while others are rele relegated to 14th Amendment citizenship only. The precedent for this, of course, is the Dred Scott case. The words people of the United States and citizens are synonymous terms and mean the same thing. They both describe the political body who, according to our Republican institutions, formed the sovereignty and who hold the power and conduct the government through their representatives. They are what we familiar, familiarly, familiarly call familiarly, they are what we call familiarly call the sovereign people and every citizen is one of these people and a, const and a constituent member of this sovereignty. The question before us is whether the class of persons described in the plea in, a, in, in abatement, i.e. Negroes, compo compose a portion of this people and are, and are constituent members of this sovereignty. We think they are not and that they are not included and were not intended to be included. Under the word citizens in the constitution and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for any, for and secures to citizens of the United States. On the contrary, they were at the same time considered as a subordinate and an inferior class of beings who had been subjected by the dominant race and whether emancipated or not yet remained subject to their authority and had no rights or privileges but such as those who held the power of the government might choose to grant them well yeah that's that's biblical that's some of the curses um you
Let me try and get this. Let me read out. Uh, just gonna. One second, bear with me while I just look for this. Um, where it, because as they just said, Negroes are not included, but it's not just Negroes, it's, it's Latinos. Uh, like they are one of the tribes, they are some of the tribes of Negro, uh, some of the tribes of Israel. Um, it's the Native Americans, they are uh, some of the tribes of Israel pertaining to the Northern Kingdom. So I'll read you the curses from Deut Deuteronomy 28, which which we are, which we were dealt and are still under, but that is um, shaping to be um, removed. Um, our our sentence is being is coming to an end, and those curses are going to be put on those who have oppressed us, oppressed. Uh, oppress the tribes of Israel. So here are the curses. Deuteronomy 28 and 16. Curse shall thou be in the city, and curse shall thou be in the field. Curse shall be thy basket and thy store. Curse shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Curse shall thou, curse shall thou be when they comest in, and curse shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee curse and vexation and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do, unto thou be destroyed and unto thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings whereabout thou hast forsaken me. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest, whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with an extreme burning and with the sword and with blasting and with mildew and they shall pursue thee unto thou perish and thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust from, from heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And thy carcasses shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth. And no man shall fray, uh, shall fray from them, shall fray them away. The Lord will smite thee with the butch of Egypt and with the emeralds and with the scab and with the itch wherewith thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart, and thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Thou shalt, be, thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build a house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from, from before thy face, and shall not be restored to thee. Thou sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thy eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thy hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labours shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and they shall be only oppressed and crushed, or, or crushed away always so that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see the lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head the lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known 
and there shall they serve other gods wood and stone and thou shalt become an astonishment a proverb and a byword among all nations where the lord shall lead thee thou shalt carry much seed out onto the field and shall and shall gather but little in for the locusts shall consume it thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them but shalt neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes for the worms shall eat them thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts but thou shalt not again anoint thyself with the oil for thine oil shall have cast in his fruit thou shalt beget sons and daughters but thou shalt not enjoy them for they, for they shall go into captivity all thy trees and fruit of thy land shall the locust consume the stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high and thou shalt come down very low he shall lend to thee and thou, thou shalt not lend to him he shall be the head and thou shalt be the tail moreover all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the lord thy god to keep his commandment and his statutes which he committed thee which he commanded thee and thou, and they shall be upon thee for a sign and a wonder and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever because thou servest not the lord thy god with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies which the lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee the lord shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth as swift as the eagle flieth a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand a nation of fierce countenance which shall not regard the person of the old nor show, nor show favour to the young and he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land unto thou be destroyed which also shall not leave thee either corn wine or oil or the, or the increase of thy kind or flocks of thy sheep until he have destroyed thee and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy until thy high and fenced walls come down wherein thou trustest throughout the, all thy land and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all the land which the lord god hath given thee and thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters which the lord god hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness wherein thine enemy shall distress thee so that the man that is tender among you and very delicate his eye shall be evil towards his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children which he shall leave so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat because he hath nothing left in him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith the wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy in all thy gates so that the tender and delicate woman among you which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness her eye shall be evil towards the husband of her bosom and towards her son and towards her daughter and towards her young one that cometh out from uh, between her feet and toward her children which shall which she shall bear for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in a siege and straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this lord that are written in this book that thou might that thou mayest fear the glorious and fearful name the lord thy god yahweh then the lord will make thy plagues wonderful and the plagues of thy seed even great plagues and of long continuance and sore sicknesses and long continuance moreover he will bring upon thee all the diseases of egypt which thou wast afraid of and they shall cleave unto thee also every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law then will the lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed and ye shall be left few in number whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude because thou wouldest not obey the voice of the Lord thy God, Yahweh, And it shall come to pass that, as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught 
and ye shall be plucked from off the land whether thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth unto the other. And they shall serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night and shall have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even. And at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt shall fear. And for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. So, and the Lord shall bring you into Egypt again with ships. So, this is, this is, uh, these are some of the curses. Uh, some of this uh, has happened. Well, all, all of this has happened already. All of this has happened already. And um, yeah, so let's see. There's more. Just looking at this last verse where it says the Lord shall bring you into Egypt again with ships. I believe that is that is talking about uh, is that the time of the Yeah, this is the this is the transatlantic slave trade. I'm just looking at this last verse and the Lord shall bring you into Egypt again the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships yeah Egypt so America is sometimes referred to as Babylon it's sometimes referred to as like Egypt because America is Egypt again that's why it says the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again, again with ships that was the transatlantic slave trade and where it says and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen. Yes, you know, like the slave blocks. That 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 was that's what that's talking about. And no man, no man shall buy you. It doesn't mean that no man shall like put money down and take you as a slave. It means no man shall save you. If you go to the root word of that word buy, that 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 word is actually it means save. No man shall buy you means no man shall save you. So anyway, look, that was some of the curses. I was just reading that in, in relation to what was written here. Um, let's read that again <clears throat> regarding eagle, eagles, um, vultures and eagles clothing. So we're back at the book now. Let's, let's read this. So it says, the words people of the United States and citizens are synonymous terms and mean the same thing. They both describe the political body who, according to our Republican institutions, form the sovereignty and who hold the power and conduct the government through their representatives. They are what we familiar, familiarly, call, familiarly call the sovereign people and every citizen is one of these people and a, constitu a constituent member of the sovereignty. The question before us is whether the class of persons described in the plea in abatement, i.e. Negroes, compose a portion of this people and are a constituent members of this sovereignty. We think they are not, and that they are not included and were not in intended to be included under the word citizens in the constitution and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. On the contrary, they were at the same time considered as a subordinate and an inferior class of beings who had been subjugated by the dominant race and whether emancipated or not emancipated mean freed uh, you know, the whole Abraham Lincoln emancipation uh, 
proclamation. It was nothing about it, just a, a changing of hands, a change, a new label. So it became like a, a modern slave. You know, you've got the term modern day slavery. Yet remained subject to their authority and had no rights or privileges, but such as those who held the power the government might choose to grant them. Yeah, so that's some of the curses, you know, you should buy, you should lend, you, you should buy and not lend, um, driven to a nation, which, which is, which language you don't understand. Um, all these, you, you heard, you know, just go over the curses of Deuteronomy 28. So that's what that is. But it, your sent the sentence is being fulfilled. This is it's becoming to an end. The Lord is like bringing back. He's building back the house of David. He's 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 building his his people, his remnant that he wants throughout the four corners of the earth. They're waking up, uh, and it's all for one purpose. So there's a few prophecies left. Um, this book has touched on it in regards to the the mark of the beast. Uh, but let's continue reading. I'll read to I'll read a few more pages. Now we are finally in a position to make sense of Senator Rogers' affidavit, with which I began this article. I, Donald A. Rogers, being of sound mind and lawful age, do solemnly declare I was born in Louisiana, state of parents who were white, who were citizen principals and whose parents time out of mind were and always had been white. The main purpose of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment was indeed to establish the citizenship of the Negro by overruling Dred Scott and because such a white man's citizenship was not restricted by the 14th Amendment, and because he receives no protection from it, he has no reciprocal obligation to a 14th Amendment allegiance or sovereignty and owes no obedience to anyone under the 14th Amendment. For the sovereign citizen, reconstruction never occurred. Legal populism is a, uh, is a subversive movement. All tax evasion and fraud is politically subversive particularly in, uh, in a society where one's status as a taxpayer is an important index of citizenship. But those who avoid paying taxes or seek to pay less than the government allows on the ground that our tax taxation system is, is itself unlawful are, uh, are subsur subversive in a particularly interesting way. Tax protesters and legal populists more generally attempt to use the machinery of law to defeat the law. They refuse to be represented by lawyers and file massive papers in court citing obscure and overruled cases. They cite as authority sources that mainstream lawyers believe to be empty of content, like the Declaration of Independence, or lacking in legitimacy, like Black Law's Dictionary of uh, Bovia's Law Dictionary. They pursue their own legal actions against the government and its officers, often filing multiple claims that repeat the same assertions, as in the common law movement. They sometimes create their own legal fora and anoint their own counter authorities. One popular mainstream reaction to legal populists is to depict them as living outside the bounds of rationality. In this conception, legal populists are both ridiculous and to be feared. They are the cultural equivalent of people who push heavily laden shopping carts down the street while mumbling to themselves, or the collective equivalent of John Walker Lind, the domestic face of anti-American terrorism or an ideological arm of racist extremist groups like the Ku Klux Klan. Repudiated by uh, contemporary American yet lingering menacing, menacingly in the shadows. A somewhat more sympath uh, sympathetic reaction popular in the, in the late 1980s is to see them as ordinary but uneducated folks who 
in innocently fall prey to a few extremists during economic hard times. Finally, legal populists are sometimes understood as religious fanatics, people who inappropriately use the frame of the divine to understand social practices that are in reality wholly secular. Although each of these perspectives is useful, in this section and the next, I put forth three additional accounts of legal populism with the intent of move, moving deeper into both sympathy and critique that, uh, typ uh, than typical mainstream accounts. Uh, as Richard Hostetter's famous essay, The Paranoid Style in American Politics, observes, Politics is made not only by elites, but also by the public. In the public sphere, political life acts as a sounding board for identities, values, fears, and aspirations. For, for Hostetter, with the help of new technologies of mass communication, politics became not only a site of uh, re reasoned debate about the institutions and process that regulate our common lives, but also a theatre in which image, images and emotions can be projected and played out. Hofstadter identified a distinctive paranoid style in politics, conspiracy theorizing, in a paradi paradi uh, paradigmatic example of politics in the public sphere expressed in the paranoid style. And one way to understand legal populism is to treat it as a form of conspiracy theory, certainly as a sub, uh, substantive matter. Conspiracy theory and legal populism overlap considerably. The constitutional literature of tax protest, for example, provides an easy portal into venerable conspiracy theories. The first step is to recognize that the Internal Revenue Service and the Federal Reserve Bank are legally rogue organizations because they are ungrounded in the original constitution. The second step is to see them politically as a threat to, li uh, to liberty because of their enormous power over ordinary citizens, because of their secrecy and obscurism, obscurantism which, with which they operate and because they are controlled by the elites, enabling a small group of people to amass wealth and power for themselves at the expense of the masses. Well, as you can see, um, if, just, uh, if I put my own um, take on what is being read here, just type into Google amount of debt in America or debt, Federal, Federal Reserve debt clock, Federal Reserve debt clock. And then you'll see how much um, debt is being put on to the, the America as a country whilst, whilst, whilst that money goes up, that money uh, as it's going up, because if you type it in and you look at the debt clock and you see the money going up, it also represents money going into pockets of others. Because basically, as that money goes up, it's creating slaves. It's enslaving. That money going up is 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 uh, synonymous to enslavement of the people. So. Let's continue reading. The second step is to see them politically as a threat to liberty because of their enormous power over ordinary citizens, because of the secrecy and obscurantism with which they operate, and because they are controlled by elites enabling a small group of people to amass wealth and power for themselves at the expense of the masses. The third step is to recognize the link between the rogue organizations and the larger, larger conspiracy to establish a global new world order well, it's not a conspiracy that, that, that's literally written on the dollar bill. Novos Ordo Seclorum is written on the dollar bill that is Latin for New World Order. The idea of the New World Order is that a small 
coterie of bankers, so a small group of bankers and politicians using international politic political institutions such as the United States, will create a unified world government and through this project achieve political and econ economic tyranny over the rest of the world. From here, it is only a small step into the sordid depths of Christian identity doctrine and the old canons of anti-Semitism, such as the claim that Jews, bankers, financiers, financiers and internationalists are working in secret to control the course of political events. Well, yeah, that, <laughs> you said it. Another example of the link between the legal populism and conspiracy theory is the idea popular within legal populism that we in the United States are living under a false legal system identified variously as law, merchant, equity or maritime law. Maritime law, so that that's pertaining to the waters. And that a conspiracy exists to perpetuate this false legal system as a way of tricking Americans out of their true rights. The ultimate roots of this conspiracy are disputed. One website, for instance, locates the beginnings of the supplanting of the common law by admir admiralty law in the doings of the George Rapp Harmony Society, a 19th century utopian community founded by one George Rapp in 1805. As the website declares, Evidence will show that uh, the tremendous wealth accumulated by the society was subsequently used to fashion a George Rapp society on a, marge, on a much larger scale, with plans to ultimately encompass the world in a super state, controlled and governed by uh, mercantile interests under the law of admirably a super state wherein all the property in the world and all the people on spaceship Earth are pledged to the benefit of the worldwide mercantile association, the New World Order. So, let's leave that there and I'll continue to read on the next... Uh, yep, yeah, I'll continue to read on the next. Very interesting read. So all praise to Yahweh, Bashem Yahweh Shad, um, Bashem Kakodash, double honors again to the apostles of Great Millstone, peace and salutation to all the Akim, all the um, bishops, all the elders pushing the gospel in truth and sincerity. Shalom.